During this chapter, you will learn different and fascinating aspects of the physiology of the respiratory system. For example, include ventilation, that is also called breathing. You will learn about the mechanism by which we can move air in and out of the lungs. You will learn about the gas exchange and how the gas exchange is produced in the two places where we can produce that gas and change. One is in the capillaries at the lungs or around the alveoli and at the capillaries that are called systemic capillaries. You will also learn about oxygen utilization because basically oxygen is needed to produce ATP during cellular respiration. In other words, ventilation and gas exchange in the lungs respond to what is called external respiration but we also have internal respiration that is produced between the, um, the gases and the cells in both in our organism or by the cells we intake oxygen the cells too and we eliminate carbon dioxide the cells too now, there are certain concepts that you have to be very clear about it. And one of them is how the, how the uh, gas exchange in the alveoli, alveoli capillaries or other systemic capillaries can happen. And this movement of gases at these two capillaries, either are the alveoli, around the alveoli, or at the systemic capillaries, happen by diffusion. Now, the gases move always from higher concentration to lower concentration. And concentration of the gas in, in a place is also representative of the pressure that that gases can produce in that area. That's why we use either the word concentration of the gas or pressure of the gas. So gases move always from higher concentration or higher pressure to lower concentration or lower pressure. That, by the way, is the same uh, um, statement that define diffusion. For example, the oxygen concentration is higher in the alveoli than in the capillaries around the alveoli. And reason why oxygen move diffuse from inside the alveoli into the alveoli capillary to be distributed inside the body. At the same time, carbon, carbon dioxide concentration in the alveoli capillaries is higher than in the alveoli by itself and is reason why the carbon dioxide diffuses out of that capillary into the alveoli. Now, to study the physiology of the respiratory system, we need to divide this respiratory system into areas. One is called conducting zone and the other one is respiratory zone. The conducting zone is just the track where the air is uh, moving in and out of the body. And the respiratory zone is the site for gas exchange. In other words, the conducting zone is made by all the respiratory tract, starting from the nostril, the nasal cavity, all the way down, uh, the trachea, the bronchioles, the um, bronchial tree, all that is the re conducting zone. The respiratory zone is the site for gas exchange, so only is the alveoli. Now, what is called the functional unit of the respiratory system is the alveoli. The alveoli that is composed by uh, different alveolar sacs and is the place for gas exchange. We have really large amount of them, around 300 million of them, and uh, between all together, they provide the large surface area that increase the diffusion rate. 
each alveolus is one cell layer, one cell layer thick, one cell that is the uh, simple squamous epithelium, and form clusters at the end of the respiratory bronchiolis. That clusters is called the alveolar sac. In this closer look of the alveoli and the capillaries, you can observe the central, the core, that is the alveoli by itself with the different type of cells. You can recognize also the macrophase. Uh, you can recognize the type 1, uh, type 1 cells that are uh, basically the simple squamous epithelium, the type 2 cells that are uh, the one that produce the surfactants, the layer of surfactants uh, that are leaning that alveoli, but surrounded around you have the capillaries, the capillaries that is a really very dense network around any single alveoli and alveolar sac. I mentioned before, there are two types of cells found in the alveoli. One is the type 1, that is the one used for gas exchange, the simple squamous epithelium. 95-97% of the surface is produced by this type 1. And the type 2 are the ones that secrete surfactants. The surfactant is uh, a fluid, is a uh, basically by a structure is one kind of lipid similar to the phospholipids and uh, produce an oily fluid that is bathing the alveoli inside and the function is to uh, avoid the collapsing of the alveoli when we, we breathe out. Anatomy it's important to identify the pathway of air that, as I mentioned before, is starting in the nostrils using the nasal cavity, uh, following by the pharynx. The pharynx gets into the larynx, where also we have the vocal cords. Passing to the vocal cords, reach the trachea, and the trachea is uh, bifurcated in the primary bronchis. That primary bronchis are the ones that get into the lungs, right and left, and produce the bronchial tree, producing uh, the secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi. Um, in other words, it's branching out, branching out, getting smaller and smaller, and the final produce the terminal bronchiolis. And all this part from the nostrils to the terminal bronchiolis is uh, the, the one that what we call the, um, the conducting zone of the respiratory system. The one that is also called the respiratory tract. Now, at the end of this respira the respiratory tract, we have the respiratory zone where we have the alveolar sacs, where the gas exchange is only used to be produced. Yes, as I mentioned before, after the trachea is bifurcated and produced the primary bronchis uh, that get into the two lungs, the right and the left. And when get into the lungs is uh, branching out, out, getting smaller, 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 producing the bronchial tree. And the final portion of that bronchial tree is the respiratory zone of the respiratory system where we have the alveolar sacs with the alveolus or alveoli. Now, what is the function of the conducting zone? It's not only to transport air, uh, to the lungs or take uh, waste material from inside the lungs to the atmosphere. It also has the function to warm, humidify, filter and clean the air before it's getting into the alveoli. Uh, 
Um, so we have different areas in that um, conducting zone that has that function, the warms, humidify, filter, and clean the air. But also we have the area for voice production, production that is in the larynx. The larynx is the enlargement of that below the pharynx. We have an enlargement of that tube where we have the larynx. And uh, the air is passing through the larynx from the lungs out, uh, produce vibration of the vocal cords inside the larynx and produce the voice. In that picture, you have a visualization, a superior visual visualization of the entrance of the larynx. And as you can see, is a cover by the famous glottis that can be open and closed. But that larynx is also protected by one cartilage, a specific one cartilage called epiglottis. The epiglottis is one flap that cover that larynx in case we need to swallow because the pharynx is used for the respiratory system and for the digestive system. So if we need to swallow something, that epiglottis close the entrance of the larynx and the product that we swallow go to the tube that is behind the, um, behind the trachea that is the esophagus. On the contrary, if we inhale, uh, that epiglottis is open, allowing the air get into the larynx and from the larynx get down into the trachea. I hope you remember the basic anatomy in the thoracic cavity because basically uh, you have to be knowledgeable, you have to visualize the location of the lungs and how the lungs are protected by these famous serous membranes that they are called pleura with the two layers. The inner layer that is attached to the surface of the lungs called visceral pleura and the other layer that is towards the thoracic cavity called um, parietal pleura. And between these two layers there is an space uh, is called interpleural space that is filled with the fluid. Uh, what is the function of the pleura is not only for protection, it's also is moving accordingly with the movement of the lungs. If the lungs are distended, the pleura is moving accordingly with that. If the lungs recall, the pleura follow the recall of the lungs. And the uh, reason why these two layers cannot collapse is because in the interpleura space, there is a fluid that avoids that friction. Now, the thoracic cavity also um, is important to understand what is the floor or the thoracic cavity that is made by the famous diaphragm. The diaphragm is the main muscle of respiration and the location of this diaphragm that is a dome shape is a skeletal muscle um, and separates the thoracic cavity to the abdominal cavity. Remember from anatomy that this diaphragm has three openings for one is the descending aorta, the other one is from the vena cava, as, uh, the uh, inferior vena cava, and the third opening is for the esophagus, are the three structures that cross the diaphragm from the thoracic cavity into the abdominal cavity. And the place where these three structures go through the diaphragm is called the hiatus. These two x-rays represent x-ray from a female or for a male patient. In the superior, you have a female patient that um, is clearly the capacity of the lungs are a little smaller than the male. 
And it's one of the characteristics that um, is, is pretty much a pattern uh, between sex, where the males has larger capacities of air in the lungs than females. But obviously, we have to compare always apple with apples, because we have to compare males and females at the same age, we have to compare male and female with the same height and with the same physical activity in order to be comparable. Now it's time to talk about the physical aspects of air's movement or ventilation. I mentioned before that the air moves from higher to lower pressure. Also, we mentioned that it's equivalent to higher concentration to lower concentration. In order to be more concise, we are going to use always the word pressure. Now, what is important is also three characteristics of this respiratory system. One is called compliance, the other is called elasticity, and the other one is surface tension. And these three are physical properties of the lung. Compliance, elasticity, and surface tension. They are physical properties of the lungs. What does it mean compliance? is the capacity of the lungs to expand. What does it mean elasticity? is the capacity of the lungs to recall or recover the normal shape. And the surface tension, stand for, is the force that opposes the lungs expansion. In other words, is antagonist to compliance. You also have to understand or recognize the three most important pressures that take place in that game of breathing and breathe out. One of them is the atmospheric pressure, that is the pressure of the air outside the body, that at the sea level is general talking 760 millimeters of mercury. The other one is the intrapulmonary or intraalveolar pressure and is the pressure inside the alveoli. Lungs is very broad word, it's inside the alveoli. And the third one, most important, is the intrapleural pressure. Is the pressure within that intrapleural space. Remember I mentioned that the two layers of the serous membrane, the two layers of the pleura are the uh, visceral pleura and parietal pleura, well, this space that contains a fluid also has a pressure and is measurable as well. So the three pressures that um, take place and they play together in order to breathe in and breathe out are the atmospheric pressure, intrapulmonary pressure, and the intrapleural uh, pressure mentioned before about the um, atmospheric pressure and the intraalveolar pressure. We mentioned also about the intrapleural pressure and where it's coming from. What I want you to know is that the intrapleural pressure is always lower than the intraalveolar pressure and lower than the atmospheric pressure in both, in inspiration and expiration. And the function of this pressure is um, keep the lungs against the thoracic cavity or the thoracic wall and allows the lungs to expand during inspiration. Now, in this graphic, you have the representation about the uh, on the top, when you read P ATM, is the pressure of the atmospheric pressure or atmospheric pressure. Now you have 
inside the balloon, the yellow balloon, you have the alveoli pressure. You have also between that balloon and uh, you have a space between the balloon and the exterior wall that is uh, specifically the uh, intrapleural pressure. You have another word that is transpulmonary pressure. The transpulmonary pressure, uh, frankly, is uh, it's important too, but you don't have to know. The transpulmonary pressure is the difference between the alveolar pressure and the intrapleural pressure. And remember, the intrapleural pressure is always lower than the alveolar pressure and the atmospheric pressure. Now, you read pressure differences when breathing because it's what has to happen. They have to produce in one way or the other one, they have to create different pressures in order to produce breathing or breathe out. And we call them inhalation or exhalation. Now, the inhalation, in inhalation, the intrapulmonary, the pressure inside the alveoli have to be reduced than the atmospheric pressure in order for the air move in or we are able to breathe in. Now, how much lower it can be? It depends. If the inhalation is normal inhalation, the one that produces in and out all the time, meanwhile we are studying, now I'm talking, or during normal activities, this one is normal inhalation. But certainly that intrapulmonary pressure or intraalveolar pressure have to be reduced because remember, gases move from higher pressure to lower pressure. How much it can be reduced? In normal inhalation or exhalation, could be one, milli, one millimeter of mercury below the atmospheric pressure, or could be three millimeters, up to three millimeters of mercury below the, the atmospheric pressure. But if I produce a deep inhalation, the one that we exercise, we produce when we exercise, it could be up to 20 or 25 millimeters of mercury below the atmospheric pressure. On the contrary, in exhalation, that intrapulmonary pressure have to be greater because remember, gases move from higher pressure to lower pressure. If we have the atmospheric pressure that is average 760 millimeters of mercury, we need to produce an intrapulmonary pressure that has to be higher than 760 millimeters of mercury. How much higher? It depends if our exhalation is normal exhalation or if our exhalation is produced in a forced exhalation. It could be between one millimeter of mercury above the atmospheric pressure or three up to three millimeters of mercury above the atmospheric pressure or in forced exhalation, we can produce a pressure that is up to 25 millimeters of mercury above that atmospheric pressure. How you can visualize what happened in the alveoli? Well, I include this graphic that I hope is going to be more clear for you. In the first sac that you have on the top left, you have the alveoli in normal scenario. No breathing in, no breathing out. But when we produce in the second, the second balloon that you have starting from the left, you have the errors that means that this alveoli is expanded. And when it's expanded, what happened? The pressure inside the alveoli decreases. 
because the volume, so not the volume, the capacity of that alveoli increase. Increase the capacity, reduce the pressure, and reducing the pressure, allow the air get from the atmospheric into the alveoli. On the right side, on the right side, you have the normal alveoli. But what happened? You have the arrows that are pressuring or are pushing that alveoli or shrinking the alveoli. When we shrink or we pressure in that alveoli, that capacity of that alveoli is reduced and that is the trigger by which the pressure inside the alveoli increase. When that pressure inside of the alveoli increase, we can breathe out. And I hope this one is going to be much clearer for you. I mentioned before the relation between the pressure of the gas and the place where the gas is contained. And this one is explained by the Boyle's law. The Boyle's law states that the pressure of the gas increases as the volume of the container decreases. And when we talk about volume of the container, we talk about the capacity of the container. So larger is the container, lower is the pressure. And I want to associate that with the alveoli because it's what really need to know. In an increase, in lungs volume during inspiration decreases the intrapulmonary pressure to be below the atmospheric levels. And this one is the reason why air gets into the alveoli. Now, a decrease in the lungs or the alveoli volume during expira expiration or exhalation increase the intrapulmonary or intraalveolar pressure above the atmospheric level and is the reason why the air gets out. In the previous slide, I mentioned or you visualize how the, uh, how the, uh, the size of the alveoli can trigger the air inside or trigger the air outside of the alveoli. And this one is related to the Boyle's law. And the Boyle's law states that the pressure of the gas increases as the volume of the container decreases. So higher the volume, lower the pressure. As you watched in the previous video, when the alveoli increase the volume, and increase the size is enlarged, the pressure is reduced comparing with the atmospheric pressure. When the alveoli is shrinking, reduce, uh, increase the pressure comparing with the, uh, comparing with the atmospheric pressure. Now, in other words, an increase in the alveoli volume during inspiration decreases the intrapulmonary or intraalveolar pressure below the atmospheric level. And this one is the reason why air goes in. In other words, air moves from higher pressure, that is the atmospheric, to a lower pressure. On the contrary, a decrease or a shrink in the alveoli volume during expiration or exhalation increase that intra pleura, yeah, sorry, intrapulmonary or intraalveolar pressure that become above the atmospheric level. Reason why air is moving out always from higher pressure to lower pressure. We mentioned before about the physical properties of the lungs. They were compliance, elasticity, and surface tension. And I want to emphasize something about the lungs compliance. That is also the capability of the lungs to expand. And they have low compliance. What does it mean that is 
the little amount of air are capable to produce expansion in the lungs. But another important concept about that property is that we have to expand our lungs before in order to air gets into inside the alveoli. Remember, we have to produce the expansion before that when the lungs expand, expand everything. It's like a sponge. And inside the lungs, we have the alveoli. When we expand the lungs, we expand the alveoli. Expanding the alveoli, we reduce the pressure in that alveolar, alveoli and air is capable to get into from the atmospheric pressure inside the alveoli, from higher pressure to lower pressure. Now, the other physical property of the lung is also called elasticity, but is synonym of recall. What does it mean elasticity or recall? is the capability of the lungs to recover the original shape. That one is called elasticity, and it's a physical property of an element, too. Now, why? Be because the lung has a lot of elastic fibers. And what is important about the elasticity is that when the lungs are capable to recall, recover the normal shape, a shrink inside pushing in that alveoli inside the lungs and increasing the pressure in that alveoli are allowing the air inside the alveoli to get out and we are possible to eliminate carbon dioxide. Remember, we need to shrink the alveoli, reduce the size of the alveoli, increase the pressure in the alveoli to allow the air inside with high concentration of carbon dioxide now and eliminate that carbon dioxide because the pressure inside the alveoli become higher than the atmospheric pressure and gases move from higher pressure to lower we briefly mentioned before about the type of cells that are found within or around the alveoli. We mentioned that one of them are the type 2. The type 2 cells around the alveoli is the one that produce surfactants. And I mentioned that the surfactants is one type of lipid, is one type of phospholipid specifically, and is the one that uh, produce or is bathing the alveoli inside, is leaning that alveoli with it, this oily secretion. And the function of this oily secretion of the surfactants is to um, avoid the collapsing of the alveoli when the lungs recoil. When the lungs recoil, that alveoli that are really very tiny mini, they reduce the size and eventually they can get uh, sticky between uh, be all, the, all the cells uh, inside the alveoli, can become sticky and they can collapse. However, because we have the surfactant that is an oily product, an oily fluid, that alveoli, even when it's shrinking at the most, is capable to enlarge or distend again. In other words, the surfactant prevents a collapse. Now you have the second chance to visualize the um, the type of cells that are found in the alveoli. We mentioned before that you have the macrophage also that is related to the first line of defense in the immune system. But the other two, two cells, the other two type of cells are the type 1, that is the simple squamous epithelium, and the type 2, that is this, the one that produce surfactants. Now, the lack of surfactants can produce two remarkable 
uh, disorders of the respiratory system. One is called respiratory distress syndrome that is uh, uh, affecting mainly uh, premature babies when they have lack of surfactants produced. And they are treated with surfactants. Uh, in general, premature babies or babies that at the due day, they are not able to produce significant amount of surfactants. And as a preventive, uh, um, uh, preventive uh, treatment, the, either the premature or the babies that doesn't have enough amount of surfactant products, products, production, they are keeping in an incubator for a few days. Now, there are another syndrome similar to this one, but this one is called acute respiratory distress syndrome that is produced in adults and is produced by the septic shock um, that reduce the lack compliance and reduce the surfactants. The septic shock is is, uh, is a bacterial shock when the patient is uh, affected by a general uh, general uh, infection in, in the entire body. And this acute respiratory distress that are suffered by adults is not treatable with surfactants. In fact, is the cause of many adults that are exposed to septic shock and they cannot survive because it's, it's acute, it's very, very fast, and some patients doesn't uh, recover properly or uh, they don't respond properly to the treatment that is with antibiotics. Now, how we can breathe, how we can breathe in, how we can breathe out, this mechanism is called pulmonary ventilation and has two single steps. One is called inspiration or inhalation and is also called breathing. The other one is called expiration or exhalation and is also called breathe out. And this mechanism is accomplished by changing the thoracic cavity or lungs volume. And remember, we need to change the thoracic cavity of the lungs or the lungs volume in order to produce breathe in or breathe out. Remember, we have to change the thoracic cavity or the lungs volume. Why? Because when we change the lungs volume, we change the alveoli volume. And this one is the target. These two x-rays represent or are uh, exposing how the lungs are changing the volume and changing the capacity because is basically what our body needs to produce in order to allow air get in or get out. On the left, you have the graphic of expiration or exhalation, how the lungs are shrinking. And, and is beyond the point of recall. And on the, on the right, you have uh, um, an X-ray of inhalation, the lungs during inhalation, and how that thoracic cavity is enlarging, is expanding, is bigger in order to allow the lungs to expand accordingly with that expansion. Now, we talk about the different type of inhalation of exhalation, that it can be a normal inhalation or normal exhalation, but also we can produce a forced inhalation or forced exhalation. In a normal inhalation, we need the contraction of the diaphragm and external intercostals. These one are the only two skeletal muscles we use for normal inhalation. The diaphragm goes down, the external intercostals enlarge a little bit the thoracic cavity. At the point that we produce a normal inhalation, the other person in front of us cannot visualize uh, 
if our thoracic cavity is moving because it's really very not visible, but we still produce a little enlargement of that thoracic cavity by contraction of the diaphragm and external intercostals. Now, for normal exhalation, keep in mind, no muscle is contract, just the diaphragm and external intercostals are the ones that recoil, just recoil, recover the normal shape and that thoracic cavity recover the normal, uh, the normal size. Now, if we talk about the force inhalation and force exhalation, we need to recruit more muscles to either enlarge even more the thoracic cavity or shrink and compress the thoracic cavity to the maximum, maximum level. In force inhalation, we need the contraction of the diaphragm and external intercostal, but we also need the contraction of the pectoralis minor, serratus posterior superior, escalator, Leans, sternocleidomastoid, levator scapula, because we need to enlarge the thoracic cavity in the maximum capacity, not only vertically, not only horizontally, also anterior posteriorly. And the way that we do is in uh, recruiting all these muscles. On the force exhalation, we need the recall of the diaphragm and external intercostal, that one for sure, but we also need an additional or synergies muscle that help the thoracic cavity to produce a larger contraction. Remember, remember that we produce a force exhalation after we produce a force inhalation. In other words, we have a larger amount of air inside the lungs to need uh, to be excelled. And in order to do that, we need to compress the thoracic cavity even more. So because of that, the recall of diaphragm and external intercostal are not enough. Reason why we engage the internal intercostal, serratus posterior inferior, abdominal muscles, all of them, rectus abdominis, external oblique, internal oblique, and transversus abdominis. In this beautiful drawing, you can visualize most of the muscles that we use for inhalation and exhalation. Unfortunately, there is no division from the back where we have the serratus posterior superior or the serratus posterior inferior that are used for force inhalation or force uh, exhalation. As I mentioned before, in, um, in order to produce a breathing inspiration, you bet that the thoracic cavity and the lungs volume have to increase. How we increase the thoracic, um, the thoracic capacity or how we enlarge the thoracic capacity and doing so we increase the lungs volume and doing so, we increase the alveolar volume is only by the skeletal muscles, by which we produce an intrapulmonary pressure or intraalveolar pressure that is below than the atmospheric pressure. And reason why the air can get into. In expiration, is the opposite way. We need to compress the thoracic cavity to reduce the volume of the, of the lungs, reduce the volume of the alveoli, increase the intraalveolar pressure inside the alveoli, and doing so, the air gets out. I invite you to read this graphic where it is referring to a normal, uh, quiet breathing, either normal inspiration, normal expiration, or force inspiration or force expiration. But basically, if you uh, have to analyze this situation, 
you always come out with the same conclusion. The thoracic cavity have to change the capacity first in order to trigger all the other steps. So if the thoracic cavity doesn't change, nothing is going to happen. In the same note, you can see the lungs number one at rest, where we have the atmospheric pressure that is 760 millimeters of mercury, the intrapulmonary pressure that is the same, and the intrapleural pressure that is little below, because the intrapleural pressure is always below, the, is always less than the intra alveolar or the atmospheric pressure, regardless any scenario. On the picture number two, you have the capability to get air into the lungs. Why? Because the thoracic cavity expands. And by expanding the thoracic cavity, the capacity of that alveoli also increase, decreasing the pressure. Not much, because this one is normal inspiration. How much is the atmospheric pressure? 760. How much is reduced? to 754 millimeters of mercury. So it doesn't have to be much, have to be just a little. On the contrary, to produce expiration, we compress the thoracic cavity using all that muscles, and compressing the thoracic cavity, we compress the lungs. Compressing the lungs, compress or a shrink the alveoli inside. When the alveoli is compressed inside, increase the pressure. And not necessarily it has to be a tremendous amount of pressure increase, just a little, like you have over here, 757 millimeters of mercury, comparing with the atmospheric pressure that is 760, enough to produce air out or breathing out. How we know if our lungs are function properly? We have a test called a spirometry. That test is the one that measures our lungs volumes and capacities. Obviously, that lung volumes and capacities are subject to, are subject to different factors that affect the volumes and capacities in the right way, because they modify the volumes and capacity. One of them is the sex. Uh, Men has more volumes than women, as I mentioned before, but there are other factors, like is the height of the patient, uh, and it's also the age of the patient. That one are broadly the most important, but there are another factors that affect the volumes and capacity. One is the weight of the patient, the other one is the uh, uh, type of life of that patient. For example, if the patient is a smoker, is affecting tremendously those volumes and capacities. If the patient is an athlete, is affecting the volumes and capacities also in the right way, obviously. Uh, but you don't necessarily have to be an athlete, but exercising regularly is the one that improves our lungs volumes and capacity. But also this spirometry is another way to diagnose different restrictive or obstructive lungs disorders that I will refer at the end of this PowerPoint. Please take the time to study a little bit about these volumes that can be measurable in our lungs with this test that is called spirometry. One is considered the tidal volume. That basically is the uh, amount of air that we can inhale or exhale during quiet breathing. Means that meanwhile we are studying, watching a movie, not really very important uh, physical exercise involved. The other one is the expiratory reserve volume, that is the amount of air that we can force out after tidal volume. Uh, 
The other one is inspiratory reserve volume. It's the amount of air that we can be forced in after tidal volume. The last one is called residual vol volume, and the residual volume is the amount that remain in the lungs no matter what, regardless um, how much we can excel, there is always a certain amount of volume that remain in our lungs. After we collect the volumes, we can calculate the lungs capacities or we can measure the lung capacities. One important lung capacity is called vital capacity. The other one is total lung capacity. And the other one is inspiratory capacity. In the next graphic, you can visualize how you can calculate those capacities. This is the graphic that I mentioned before. In the right side, or is the left side? It's the left side, sorry. In the left side, you have the collection of the different type of volumes. Tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume, and reserve volume. At the bottom, you have pretty much the average of volume of them. Then, Frankly, I'm not going to ask you which one, uh, or what kind of volumes are normal for any kind of those. But certainly, you need to know how you can define the inspiratory reserve volume, or expiratory reserve volume, or reserve volume, or tidal volume. The truth is that in the right side of that graphic, you have how you calculate the capacities. I mentioned before the vital capacity. And if you notice, the vital capacity is measurable when you add the tidal volume, the inspiratory reserve volume, and the expiratory reserve volume. The other one is the inspiratory capacity, means how much air you can inhale total and include the tidal volume and the inspiratory reserve volume. How you can calculate the total lungs capacity is adding all, all the volumes, tidal volume plus expiratory reserve volume, plus inspiratory reserve volume, plus reserve volume, means the total amount of air that your lungs can kept, basically. This one is the meaning of the spirometry. I mentioned before that the disorders in the respiratory system can be organized in two major groups. One is called restrictive, and the restrictive one involves a disorder or the lungs tissue is damaged. And the vital capacity is reduced. When the lung tissue is damaged, the lungs is losing compliance, means that they cannot expand. For different reasons, the lungs cannot expand. If the lungs cannot expand, is losing compliance, obviously we cannot get the amount of this air that our body is looking for. And obviously we cannot eliminate the amount of carbon dioxide that is needed. In the obstructive disorder, in the obstructive disorder, the lungs tissue is totally normal, but what is affected is the respiratory tract. That famous pipes or respiratory tract is affected and producing different disorders. In restrictive disorder, sample of those, we have a pulmonary fibrosis, emphysema, mesothelioma, that is a kind of cancer, lung cancer. I'm going to explain in more detail about those. Uh, 
um, and in obstructive disorder, our uh, most common one is COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. But also asthma is a type of obstructive, chronic bronchitis, emphysema too, is even if you notice emphysema is enclosed in both types. Um, anaphylactic shock is another type of obstructive. In this obstructive, the pipes, the respiratory pipes or the respiratory tracts are tremendously narrowed down. They reduce the radius inside by inflammatory process and by which the patient cannot get the amount of air they desire and they cannot excel the amount of air that this body need to, re need to um, remove. I try to organize the respiratory disorders in the two major groups, obstructive and restrictive, in uh, more details for you to study and I, I hope that really it helped. I want to mention something about mesothelioma um, uh, because mesothelioma is a type of cancer but if you investigate a little bit mesothelioma involves a cancer of that famous exterior layer of the lungs that is part of the pleura by which that layer is not capable to distend. Because of that, the lungs cannot expand. In cancer lungs that involve the cancer of the lungs tissue by itself, uh, well, obviously, the lungs are losing the capability to expand, are losing uh, uh, compliance. Pulmonary fibrosis or cystic fibrosis is the same thing. In all the restrictive disorders, the lungs are losing compliance. The pipes are totally fine, but if the lungs cannot expand, they cannot recall. And if they cannot expand, air is not getting into, or is not getting into enough amount of air. Um, and I hope with this explanation is a little more clear the difference between restrictive and obstructive disorders. This graphic represents how the respiratory uh, system is affected by obstructive or restrictive uh, disorders. If we have a normal uh, respiratory system, the amount of air getting in to getting out is not affected. If we suffer an obstructive respiratory disorder by which the pipes are affected, yes, the amount of air that is getting into or getting out is affected, but it's way more affected if the patient suffer a restrictive respiratory disorder, kind of mesothelioma or um, pulmonary fibrosis uh, or cancer, um, any kind of those produce a restrictive uh, disorder um, by which is um, that compliance is severely affected and is severely affected the normal inhalation and exhalation. In the following slides, you have more details about the different type of respiratory disorders that I invite you to read and to acquire that knowledge in more details.